Hey guys, Smith Marusik here, and in this video, we're going to talk about what we can do to speed up a chemical reaction. Now, hopefully you watched the fun little video I linked in my playlist about how to get a date in chemistry. I know it's kind of silly, but I think it does a great job of giving us an analogy to visualize what these changes can do to impacting the rate of a chemical reaction. So we're going to talk about all of those factors in this video, kind of going into the detail behind them, but also I'm going to talk about a few things at the video didn't mention as far as other things that could impact the rate of a reaction. Um, so just as a reminder, all of our factors that impact rate have an effect on one of three things, either the frequency of collisions, getting us to just have a greater number of overall collisions, uh, the energy of the collisions, either giving molecules more energy that they can use to overcome activation energy, or maybe by changing the activation energy amount itself. And then finally, maybe possibly improving the orientation of those collisions. So at least one of those three things will be impacted by each of these factors. Now, the first factor that we're gonna talk about was actually not mentioned in the video, and that is just the nature of the reaction itself. What kind of reactants do I have present? Now, this is a little bit different than taking a singular reaction reaction and trying to speed it up. Here what we're trying to do is say, hey, if we have two different reactions, what might cause one reaction to be faster than another? Um, so some things that could make a difference. First off, if we have reactions that involve solids, those tend to be a little bit slower. The reason why is that solids have really low freedom of motion in their particles, and so it's more difficult for those particles to interact with each other and get collisions out of the deal. Also, redox reactions are typically slower. Remember, in a redox reaction, oxidation numbers change, and that involves a loss and gain of electrons. And when you have to transfer those electrons around, that can take longer. So think back to some of the reactions that we know are for sure redox, things like, say, synthesis or single replacement reactions, where we know we have things that have oxidation numbers that are changing. Those reactions tend to be slower than say a reaction where oxidation numbers don't change, like say maybe a double replacement reaction. Also, reactions involving substances with really strong bonds are typically slower. Remember, part of what we're trying to do in a chemical reaction is break the original bonds so that I can form new bonds. And so if those original bonds are really, really strong and hard to break, you're going to need a lot of energy to break those apart. And so therefore, it might take a lot longer for that reaction to take place if we don't have that sufficient energy that we need to transition over to products. Along those same lines, uh, reactions with a higher activation energy are typically slower than reactions with a lower activation energy. Um, let's compare three reactions here. Now, I know you might First off the bat, notice that one of these is endothermic while these other two are exothermic. But I'll be honest, that doesn't make a difference at all when you are considering these three reactions. If I was trying to pick out the slowest and the fastest reaction, what I would want to look at is the activation energy amount. How much energy must be gained from the reactants up to the activated complex? How much energy do I need to gain to break the bonds that are there before they're allowed to reform? So here I need to gain an incredible amount of energy to get up to the activated complex. That activation energy here is huge. And so I would predict that this would probably be the slowest of the three reactions. On the flip side, this one has a really small activation energy. It doesn't take much energy to be gained to break those bonds and get over to the product side. So having a low activation energy would mean that this was probably the fastest reaction. And then of course, reaction B here would probably fall somewhere in the middle. So then if I'm comparing these two, say on a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve, here's what that would look like. So 
right here I've done reaction A. Remember that was the one that had the really high activation energy back over here. And so on this Maxwell Boltzmann, what I've done is I've marked the speed at which those molecules would have sufficient energy to make a successful collision. And so any of them that I've shaded in here past that point in that pink color would be molecules that have enough energy that when they collide would actually make product. However, for reaction C here, it had a much lower activation energy, which means its activation energy would be scooched back on this kinetic energy uh, axis here. And so what that means is that any molecules past that point would have sufficient energy. So you notice as that energy activation energy backs up, that lower activation energy means a greater fraction of molecules would have sufficient energy in order to transition over to products, which is why it ends up being so much faster. All right, let's get to some of the factors that the video talked about. So one of them that the video talked about was temperature. I think it mentioned um, if you caused the passing period to be decreased and everybody was moving fast from class to class, what would that do? Uh, temperature is an interesting one because it actually impacts two traits of a reaction. So this is something that you would want to make sure you knew, say, for an FRQ question. Temperature will impact both the frequency of collisions, but also the effectiveness of those collisions. And the reason why is an increase in kinetic energy means that there is increased molecular movement. Your molecules are moving faster and crazier. And so there are more frequent collisions. And so that just gets a sheer greater number of collisions. And so that alone would help to speed up that chemical reaction. However, the collisions will also have more energy, meaning that not only are there more collisions, but the collisions are hitting with more oomph. And if they're hitting with more oomph, more of the collisions will have enough activation energy to have an effective collision. So you do want to mention on temperature, if you're ever asked on an FAQ question, what impact this would have on your reaction rate, you would want to say that it increases the number of collisions as well as how much energy those collisions have. It impacts both things. Um, to see this effect on a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve, uh, you notice that here they've done the thing where we've flattened the curve as we got to a higher temperature. Now, the activation energy wouldn't budge as long as you have the same reaction. So this is the same reaction occurring at two different temperatures. I still have to have the same amount of energy. But notice when I flatten that curve to 310 Kelvin here, what happens is that in flattening that curve and extending it a little bit further, I end up with the greater fraction of molecules that have enough activation energy. Uh, in green here, I've highlighted how many had it at 300. With the blue stripe, and you can see that extends beyond the green, that would be at that 310 Kelvin. So even though it hasn't changed the activation energy amount itself, changing the curve would ensure that more molecules have sufficient energy to have a successful collision. All right, our next factor here is pressure. Now, they didn't mention it as pressure in the video. I think they talked about volume. And we have to be really careful with volume because volume itself would only impact you if your reactants were gases. So we have to be kind of careful with that one. Just changing the volume of a container with a liquid or solid that wouldn't make a difference um, if you impacted the volume of the solution, like how much liquid that might change it. But just changing the size of the container itself would not change your reaction rate unless you're dealing with gases. Um, so you can see here that when we have a really big volume, we have a low pressure. But when that volume gets small, we end up with a really high pressure. And you can see on this picture here that as we get that really high pressure, those molecules get closer and closer together. I think they talked about in the video um, making the hallways smaller. And so as I get that increase in pressure, remember pressure's about collisions. So that would mean that there's more frequent collisions occurring. And so that would lead to an increase in rate. But you got to be really careful on that one. Remember that pressure and volume changes would only affect you if your reactants were gases. 
All right, our next one is surface area. In the video, they talked about breaking up packs. Okay, um, an increase in surface area, meaning smaller pieces, leads to more frequent collisions, which leads to an increase in rate. And it's kind of the idea behind when you're eating a piece of candy, like let's say you're trying to dissolve, I don't know, a Tootsie Roll Pop or an everlasting gobstopper, something that typically you suck on and you get really impatient with it. What do you always do with it? you bite into it and you break it up into smaller pieces, right? Or at least that's what I do. I know it's really bad for your teeth, but let's be real here, we end up doing that. Well, the whole idea behind doing that is now you're exposing more of that surface and so you can dissolve it or react it more quickly. Now, this only applies to solids because solids are really the only substance uh, state that you could impact your surface area on. Okay, um, by the way, what these two pictures are trying to show here is that when I have that really big piece, the molecules in the middle here aren't getting any interaction with your solvent, and so they aren't getting um, reacted at all. However, here, once I have broken it up, what happens is that now those reactants can really interact with each other at a greater amount. All right, let's talk about the next one, adding a catalyst. Now in the video, they talked about a matchmaker. And you probably have heard about catalysts before because in biology, you talked about enzymes. And the whole idea behind an enzyme is that it would take this one component from one place and bring it to another component and basically join them up together. And then the enzyme would go on its merry way to go join up more things. Well, that's what a catalyst does. A catalyst is a substance that decreases the activation energy of a reaction because it acts as a matchmaker. Those substances don't have to utilize as much energy to find each other and collide and worry about what orientation they're in because the catalyst takes care of that work for them. It's gonna help them to come together in the correct orientation without wasting all of that energy. So catalysts help both the energy and orientation of in collisions, which would lead to an increase in rate once I apply that catalyst. Now, this is the one factor that can change a potential energy diagram curve. You notice all the other ones so far we've talked about maybe changing the Maxwell-Boltzmann curve, but we haven't talked about changing these potential energy diagrams up. So here, what's happening is that when I have activation energy with a catalyst, you notice that it's much lower than the activation energy without the catalyst. So this solid line here was the no catalyst line. This dotted line here is with the catalyst. And remember, if that activation energy is shifted back, what that would mean is that a greater number of particles would have sufficient energy to overcome activation energy and create product. Uh, in blue here, what I've highlighted, this is without a catalyst. Then when that activation energy was higher, not as many particles would have sufficient energy to end up creating product. However, some important things we have to remember about a catalyst. A catalyst itself is not considered a reactant or product in the process. It is unchanged overall. You know, even though the matchmaker matches things up, it itself can it's returned to its original state at the end, ready to go match up another pair. And so catalysts enter into the reaction and aid in the process, but they're returned to their original form. And so we're gonna talk about that more when we talk about mechanisms, because we can actually pick out catalysts within the mechanism, noting the fact that they are returned to their original form at the end of the reaction. It is reused and then reformed over and over again. Now, we can have two types of catalysts. Uh, you can have the same phase as the reactants, meaning like maybe the reactants were liquids and your catalyst is also a liquid. And so we would call those homogeneous catalysts. Or it could be in a different phase. This is pretty common to add, say, a solid catalyst to an aqueous solution reaction. And in that case, we would call it a heterogeneous catalyst. Um, as far as within a reaction, because it's not a reactant or product, we tend to show catalysts above the arrow in a reaction. 
And then again, within a mechanism, the steps, what we think happens is that the matchmaker, the catalyst X, will join up with A and say, hey, A, A, I really want you to meet my buddy B. So it joins up momentarily with A, brings it over to its buddy B, and lets A, B get matched up with X being returned unchanged, ready to be used again in another process. All right, we had one more factor that the video talked about and that is changing the molarity of the reactants. Uh, in the video, it talked about putting more kids into the school. And so that changes the molarity of that solution. And so when you have more particles that are in the same amount of space, meaning a higher concentration, that would lead to more frequent collisions, which leads to an increase in rate. Now we're gonna be talking about concentration and its impact on rate a whole bunch more here in the next week or so, because the problem is with concentration is that some Sometimes I double concentration and it might double my rate. Sometimes I double my concentration and, and it might quadruple my rate. Sometimes we double concentration and I could octuple my rate. The effect is not the same every single time. And so we're going to be utilizing something called rate laws to determine what the impact is of changing concentration on the rate. It changes with every single reaction. But in general, as I go from a low molarity to a high molarity, when I get a higher concentration, that would lead to more collisions and therefore we would have a faster rate of the reaction. But how much faster is impacted by rate loss? All right, hopefully you're feeling good about the factors that can speed up a chemical reaction. Um, you would wanna be able to state all of these factors. I have seen FRQ questions on the AP test before where they say, hey, state at least two things you could do to speed up this chemical reaction. And so you would want to be able to come up with these kinds of factors on your own. So hopefully you're feeling good about being able to do something like that. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.